Hello, my name is George Huckabee. I'm the technical sales agronomist for Vibe Crop Protection. Today, I would like to talk to you about corn nematodes. So what are nematodes? Nematodes are often referred to as roundworms, but are not really close related to true worms at all. They're multicellular with unsegmented bodies. Some of the economic species that actually feed through a dagger-like appendage called a stylet and feed on the root systems of plants. Here is some typical corn uh, nematode damage. Uh, the picture on the left shows some, some spots in the field where the plants are a lot smaller and stunted and not very healthy. And you can see the plants in the background a lot more healthy and taller. The other picture also shows the same kind of things showing this up and down as across the field. These areas kind of start small and get bigger because nematodes do not spread very fast. They, they only move about a couple of inches a year. So across that field, they move very slowly. This is what they actually do to the, the root system of a corn plant. They feed on the roots, eating the roots off, and causing them to be small and stunted. And when they become small and stunted like this, they cannot take up the nutrients and the water they need to survive. So the plants become very small and unhealthy and sometimes can even die. So what is the actual economic impact of a nematode? Uh, some numbers coming out from the U.S. say that loss is anywhere around 10%. So 10% of the yield can be reduced by corn nematodes in the field. Uh, they're worse under ideal growing conditions, so adequate moisture and temperature can cause these to be worse. Uh, and also due to a large number of alternate hosts, sometimes even though you have a field that's fallow or have a different crop in that field, you still can harbor those nematodes and have them survive off that weed species. Uh, nematode damage is often misdiagnosed and the true impacts are kind of hard to quantify unless you take a, a nematode sample. So here are three species of uh, nematodes that can, can cause some potential damage on corn. First one is a needle nematode. It's got a very high damage potential. And the reason they're called needle nematodes is because they're actually big. They, they can actually be up to a quarter inch in size, and they're, but they're transparent to where you really can't see them. Uh, they're also more severe during low temps and high moisture in the early spring. Another one is a sting nematode. It too has very high damage potential. They are found exclusively on uh, sandy ground, grow at 80% sand in the ground, and they're more prevalent in irrigated fields with a constant supply of moisture. Uh, the last one to talk about is the dagger nematode. It's got a moderate damage potential, and again, it's, it's more of a problem on sandy ground. Here are some typical thresholds for nematodes. So when you send a sample off to the lab, this is what you'll get back, and they're always reported by volumetric uh, way, so per 100 cc's of soil. So that means in 100 cc's of soil, if you have more than 30 to 40 nematodes in that sample, that's gonna be your trigger point. So once you get above this threshold, they'll uh, they'll start calling for different kind of uh, actions, you know, chemical or, or some kind of crop rotation or something. So if you see the, nema the needle nematode on here, one of those in the sample is enough to, to have an action threshold. So you found one in that sample, that means you need to do something. Uh, so nematode distribution across the, uh, the the corn belt right here, if you can tell right here, there's a lot of areas in here that are suspected nematodes and can cause a lot of damage. So it, it kind of shows you that, that this is a big problem and it's very widespread. So what do I do if I suspect that I have a nematode problem? The first thing you want to do is you, as you're planting is, is the plants are coming up and you notice something's going on. You always want to make a note of that. You want to make a note to come back and check on in the season, just kind of keep an eye on that area. In order to tell if you really have a nematode problem, you have to submit a sample to the nematode to a lab to get analysis to tell you if they have nematodes or not. Uh, the sample should be pulled in late summer, early fall when the populations are at their peak. So early in the season, the, 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 the nematode levels are low and they get they get they increase throughout the year to the to the fall and, and winter time. So how do you actually check for nematode damage? First thing you do is you look in a field and you want to see a place that, that something just doesn't look right. You kind of look at these oblong shapes, kind of elliptical shapes out there, and you want to go out there and I always pull a good plant and a bad plant to compare the two of them because you want to know what, what ideal and what's looking good. You want to know what's bad and you want to pull them up. So what you do is you get a shovel and actually dig the root system up. You don't just want to pull the plant up because if you pull the plant up, you can rip off some of the roots. So you want to use a shovel, you want to dig them up, you want to basically separate, get the oil off and be as, as, as fragile as possible, get everything out so you can see the true damage of it. Then once you compare the root systems, if, if one root system looks really good like this on the right, and another one's very, very small, and then there's probably a nematode problem in that field. Something else to also make a note of is you also want to make sure there was no chemicals applied out there or something to cause that root burn. So you want to 
you want to make sure that there, there was nothing out there, nothing was applied, there was no over application of chemical before you go spec the nematodes. So how do you actually take the sample? So we, we, what you do is you use a regular soil probe like you take a soil sample with. And what you'll do is you go to the base of that plant. You don't want to go straight down in the row. I always go at, at an angle to kind of go down. This picture on the right kind of illustrates how to do that. You want to go down at an angle. You want to go down all the way down to the root system. And you want to get about a 12 inch core coming out of this. You want a really, really long piece because nematodes are going to be, you know, they're, they're not going to be right on the surface. They're going to be pretty deep in the ground. Then you want to zigzag across the field, go into different areas out there to, to pull these samples out. You want to take at least 20 cores and put those into the sample to send it off. One key here is when you take these samples, don't just put them in a regular soil sample bag. The lab should tell you, you know, how to do that and, and, and send anything I need for the kit. But you also want to put these into a plastic bag. And the reason we do a plastic bag is that makes that that allows a sample to, to retain moisture so that it doesn't dry out. If the sample dries out, the nematodes die. So you, go, you want to keep those guys alive before they get to the lab. And also, you know, when you when you take the sample before you send it off, you don't want to just take the sample and throw it up on the dash of, of the truck because that sunlight is going to, again, it's going to heat them up and, and take all the moisture out and kill the nematodes. You want to keep them alive and you want to, you want to store them in, in not a refrigerator, but somewhere in a cooler place than in regular room temperature. So, so once you have, once you send a sample off and get the sample back, and the lab says you've got a nematode problem, so what what are some of the steps you can do to start to alleviate this issue? Uh, we use a, a system called integrated pest management, and that integrates your biological, your cultural, your physical, and chemical controls all into one. So it's not just one solution; it's it's multiple multiple solutions all put together to try to control these nematodes. And you know, the first, the foremost, the 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 main thing we do first is crop rotation. And we do crop rotation because most times nematodes don't share the same crops. So say if you have a needle nematode, it's going to it's going to live off of and eat corn roots, but it might not eat soybean roots. So you want to rotate those crops around to where you're not having the same crop in the field every, every, every single year, year in, year out. So you rotate them to try to find alternate host and uh, alternate species out there. Uh, and by doing this, you, you get these these alternate host uh, things from your extension office and your lab. So once we do that, the next thing is, is we look at resistant varieties. Most plant breeders, as they're breeding new varieties right now, they're actually looking for resistance. And that's internal genetic resistance that the plant has against those nematodes. Uh, some of the newer varieties, they've, they've really started to screen more of this and trying to find ways to have better genetic testing where they can find out, you know, a lot of these, these resistant mechanisms before they ever even have the, the, the seed released or look at it, but they can do genetic testing for it. But a lot of this is very dependent on your population, and your species. So it might control needle nematode, but it's not going to control dagger nematode. So you really also got to make note which ones they're resistant to. In our last, uh, our last cog in the wheel that this for our nematode control is actual chemical. And this is broken down into two different categories. You have seed treatments and you have infer nematicides. Seed treatments have been around for a long, long time, and, and they, they, they do very well. Um, they're very easy for the grower to use because they don't, they don't need any kind of specialized equipment. All you have to do is put the seed in there. It's already treated and you can plant. This allows the grower to plant very fast and quickly across the field. One drawback to uh, nematode seed treatments are is if the pressure gets high, they can be overwhelmed, and sometimes an, under higher pressure levels, they can have a failure out there. So the last one we'll talk about is infer nematicide. These have been around for many years, and some of the older products were, were highly effective, but they were also toxic, and, and they were they were pretty nasty products out there. And over the years, these have been phased out, and some newer products are are safe for the environment and for the users. One such product is called Averland FC by Vive Crop Protection. Averland FC, the active ingredient is avamectin. It's actually a product that's fermented from the Streptomyces aframentalis. And the way this, this product actually works on nematodes is if once a nematode ingests the product, it causes a paralysis nematode, the nematode dies. It has a favorable toxicological profile and with proper PPE can be safe to workers. Even though avamectin is sold under many trade names, Vives Averlin is very different. Averlin FC actually utilizes Vives patented allosperse technology. It's a nanotechnology that micro encapsulates the avamectin and creates a protective barrier around it. This allows Averlin FC to be mixed with liquid fertilizers. Chemistries allow growers to apply these products together. 
Being able to apply Avalon Infer, this allows more avamectin to be applied and can also provide longer controlled nematodes. Avalon is the only product, uh, Avalon is the only avamectin product that's labeled for Infer corn nematodes. For more information, here is a, uh, here's where you can go on our website and check out Avalon. Uh, it's an 8% avamectin product with 0.7 pounds AI per gallon. Thank you for your time.